What's going on everyone, it's Justin here, and today I've got next to me a very special guest, John Rettinger. He's one of the first people that I watched on YouTube before I even started, so I'm gonna let him introduce himself. So that's a nice way of calling me old. Um, I'm John Rettinger, I talk about tech for a very long time. I love, I live and breathe technology, uh, and I've seen kind of the rise and fall of, of the modern, the modern cell phone, sort of seen that change on how we consume media and how we sort of changed our lives. So today we're gonna to be talking about Apple's 2019 lineup of iPhones, the 11 Pro, the 11, and just the 11 Pro Max, and in general, what Apple has done in the past 12 years since the very first iPhone, because I was only 10 years old when that iPhone came out, so I had no idea of it, I've never had one, and I'm just really curious to learn more about the history of just how far smartphone innovation has come, or how far it could have been. So I have one, I've got the very first iPhone. Have you, you've, have you seen or held this? Yet? I have never held the first iPhone. All right, so, <laughs> Check it out. That is the first iPhone that is that ever shipped. Small. It feels a little bit like my iPod Touch because that was like my first product that I that I sort of played around with. But I remember walking past the Apple Store when the iPhone 3 was a big thing, mm -hmm. and um, I would look at it and I would see the price tag of $150. But little did I know you had to buy it on a three-year contract. So my mom said, "Oh, You're never Can oh that. Canada contract. We're still on those two-year contracts. The plans are expensive, but it's really cool to be able to see this product considering just." how special it means. I mean, I see videos all the time about the keynote, um, Steve Jobs on stage announcing a product that the world had never seen before. And I think in 2007, touchscreens were still one of those things where it was a little bit gimmicky, right? It was, you had to like hold, long press and... Well, they were mostly resistive. So they actually worked by like actually pressing in like a layer yeah. and that made the contact. A like, capacitive touchscreens were round, but this made them mainstream. And yeah. when Jobs got on stage, he's like, we're announcing three things. Remember it was, was it a world-class communications device, uh, internet browser, and a touchscreen iPod. And like, and then he's like, boom. Everything in one. And everything it kind of started one. off the hype with the iPod, which was a massive success and brought it over to a smartphone. And it was something that I feel like at the time was with the introduction, was the App Store around in? No, the App Store did not launch with the did first iPhone. The App Store that. launched with the second iPhone, the iPhone 3G, uh, was when the App Store came. So essentially the music was like the big aspect of it. And other than that, this phone only has the apps that it shipped with. Yeah, so it, it got the App Store uh, a couple days before the iPhone 3G came out. But this was it. Um, 3.5 inches feels tiny. I mean, it, feel, it feels, I mean, if you think like the iPhone 11 Pro feels like a baby phone, I mean, this thing, it's a very tiny little device, <laughs> but this was standard. Like this was the screen size and Apple rolled with the screen size, you know, until what, what, the iPhone 5, when things finally got a little bigger. So 3.5 was like, Steve Jobs was digging his feet in while, his, while Android was kind of going, yeah. you know, big and big and big. And at the time, Blackberry was still very dominant in the industry mm -hmm. with the keyboards. So going for a phone that had no keys and very few buttons compared to other phones was something that was different. And would you say at the time it was a, it was a gamble? Like, I mean, there was, there was a lot of gamble that went in yeah. here. I mean, on-screen keyboards existed, um, but they didn't exist like this and this eloquently. And so people were, I think, reticent to even try an on-screen keyboard. And you know, famously, Steve Ballmer, who was running Microsoft at the time, laughed yeah. at the iPhone. Insert the clip of him at a, at a basketball game. Yeah, I mean, just, <laughs> just laughing. And uh, the folks at BlackBerry at the time, you know, were, yeah. were laughing and... <laughs> $500 fully subsidized with a plan? I said, that is the most expensive phone in the world, and it doesn't appeal to business customers because it doesn't have a keyboard, which makes it not a very good email machine. You know, BlackBerry leading the industry, when the iPhone came out, you could see how far behind they were. At that point... They got a little bit complacent after the keyboard was yeah. such a big success. Uh, you know, you, you could choose if you wanted, I think you could choose if you wanted, what, GPS or 3G or Wi-Fi, like you, you had to pick one of yeah. those things and setting offering a device. It was all in one. That had everything. Yeah. So did you pick up the iPhone on the very first day? I did. So I didn't have the money to, to get it, but, and I actually I sold one rather on Craigslist and I used the profit to go buy one for myself. So I did get one on launch day. And I remember getting it home and unboxing it and being so excited to see it. And I went to a friend's wedding the next day and I took the phone out and showing multi-touch. And you photograph I'm, the wedding with yeah, you know, with the two megapixel, megapixel camera. The uh, but people seeing that for the first time was crazy. Yeah. And obviously now there's a big debate between Android and iOS. But when Android was being developed before the iPhone hit, it was to be a BlackBerry competitor. And yeah. they've seen images, even hardware is leaked out. Post iPhone, Android pivoted to kind of become what it is now. So whether you love Apple or hate Apple, it did give birth to yeah. to the modern Android. 
So at the time, when you picked up the phone for the very first time, was it like, did you feel like this phone was massive for what it was? Or no, was it, it, it felt, th I remember thinking like, that's a thick boy. Like it felt, it yeah. felt thick. But it's 6.5, like, I mean, yeah. nowadays. Did you, did you expect the industry to ever go towards a phone like at six and a half inches? No, nobody. <laughs> Anybody who saw that one coming is lying. Um, but I was so excited to get this thing home. I, I got it home and I set it up. I couldn't believe that I could touch the screen. And then I made a phone call to my girlfriend at the time, who's now my wife, and I couldn't hear her. <laughs> and she couldn't hear me. I had a busted first unit, which was really disappointing. <laughs> I mean, that was, that was like, a, like a gut punch. Um, so I went back to the Apple store the next morning and they had another one, they swapped it for me. And then I was happy and you could start to experience you know, what the iPhone was going to be. But it wasn't like perfect. There was a bunch of yeah. weird, like quirky things about the phone. Uh, so people complain about no headphone jack now. This headphone jack was recessed. <laughs> so that you couldn't use most headphones you couldn't plug in. You had to have like- You had to use the Apple ones. The Apple ones are like extra long headphones, which made very little sense. Um, when this thing launched, there was no video. You couldn't, there was no MMSing, you couldn't, you couldn't take video with it. So that was, Weird. It's photo only? Yeah, so photo only, no front facing camera. Selfies weren't even a thing yet. So my very first iPhone was an iPhone 4 and I remember buying it like water damaged on Craigslist and ended up like fixing it and making it work. And I remember that was kind of like my first experience with a phone, but it wasn't like a brand new phone. So I didn't really get that experience of an Apple product. But my most recent memory of like having that experience with the brand new Apple product was the iPod Touch. Hello YouTube, today I've got the unboxing of the iPod Touch second generation, eight gigabyte by Apple. Um, when the second generation came out, I couldn't afford it when it first came out, so I ended up waiting a year to buy it. But I remember when the fourth gen came out, I would call Best Buy every single day to see if they have it. And I remember that unboxing experience was just so special. The iPhone 5 was the first phone that I ended up saving up like a year and a half to purchase. And I remember just that experience of opening up the product and seeing it for the first time back when you wouldn't really see early unboxings on YouTube yeah. was so cool. So back then, I remember the iPhone was expensive. It was like seven or $800, I believe, at the time in Canada. I mean, you always got like the, the Canada tax and you got the BC tax, adds another 12%. So it's in still Canada, expensive. we're already paying a lot for these phones. But fast forward to 2019, Apple's flagship model, iPhone 11 Pro Max in 512 gigs, this thing in Canada was over $2,000. And nowadays in the smartphone market, you've got phones that start out at the price point that are pretty solid at around 300 to 400 US. And you've got great ones at around six to 700, but there are still phones on the market that are in the thousands, um, namely the Samsung Galaxy Fold, as well as the iPhone 11 Pro Max. So at the time, how much was the iPhone one and how much more expensive was it yeah. compared to any other phone on the market? Also keep in mind the fact that it was uh, it was to be purchased outright. So first, can I show some respect to your sneaker heat? I mean, the, the off-white off -white Jordans uh, <laughs> are, are about as fire as it can get. Um, but to the iPhone point, so it was 499 and 599, I believe when it launched, and it was in four gigs and eight gig sizes, which is kind of crazy now, but that was like a lot of storage yeah. at the time. For um, music. Yeah, for, I mean, pretty much just music and whatever pictures you took on your phone. But a few months later, this is kind of, I guess you could say it's the first big Apple controversy. The first iPhone controversy. First of many. First of many to come. So Apple announced a 16 gig iPhone. It's like four months after launch. They dropped the four, and I believe they dropped the price of the eight. And people were pissed. And this is one of the first times you saw Steve Jobs kind of be like, okay, our bad. Uh, and they sort of started issuing credits. I believe it was credits or a refund. They gave money back somehow. So there was, there was definitely some, some hubris there, but Apple did issue a refund. So it was a, an iPhone controversy, um, but they were expensive. In phones, most people were on, on flip phones or on Blackberries and they, we were used to getting phones for free. That was the model mostly here in the US. You sign into your contract, you get a phone, come back in two years, you get a new phone. So paying any money for a phone was different and then paying that much money for a phone was jaw dropping. Yeah. And I think a lot of people expected the iPhone to flop just based on the price point. Cause that was, I mean that, imagine going from zero to like 600 bucks yeah. or 700 bucks like that. That's a lot of money to drop on a phone where no one really saw the utility yet. And beyond that, it was edge only. You know, 3G had sort of just started to come out. It had been around, um, but sort of similar to how 5G is now. Apple didn't think it was ready. So you're getting an edge only phone 
uh, for you know six hundred bucks. It's, yeah, it's crazy. So how soon did the uh, how soon did the iPhone three G come out after that, and how much more successful was their successor to the one that kind of set everything off and convinced yeah. people? And how important was the App Store in really solidifying to consumers that paying this amount of money, you're getting an exclusive ecosystem that Apple was just starting to develop? Yeah. So the iPhone three G, I think, was a big deal. First, it was three G. So that was that was huge. But it was a full like redesign of the phone. That was really still the only time we've had sort of a one year over redesign before the S versions were even a thing, right? Yeah. So that brought the App Store, brought a bunch of features that people were wanting to the iPhone. It was that cool kind of plastic design. Um, and I think that's where you started to see the phone be successful. When the iPhone initially launched, Steve Jobs was talking about web apps. Web apps are the thing. Web apps, you can just as good. And I think Apple fell backwards into native apps. I don't. I don't believe at least native apps were as intended to be a big a part of the ecosystem as they are. And then when they realized it could be, uh, that's when I think you started to see the iPhone yeah. take off. It, it gave it more functionality than it ever could have had. So you're a developer and you've just spent two weeks or maybe a little bit longer writing this amazing app. And what is your dream? Your dream is to get it in front of every iPhone user and hopefully they love it and buy it, right? That's not possible today. Developers don't, most developers don't have those kinds of resources. Even the big developers would have a hard time getting their app in front of every iPhone user. Well, we're gonna solve that problem for every developer. So I think the next thing we're gonna talk about is the cameras and the battery. I think these are things that have really improved over the past few years, whereas batteries, a little bit less than cameras, but the innovation in smartphone cameras has been insane. I mean, we're seeing three camera setups on phones. Some of them have five, six, seven, and all over the place. There's even phones now that have like a periscoping lens on the inside of the phone that can give you 5X optical directly <laughs> from a phone. And it's usable enough that I've used it as wallpapers on computers. Yeah. How good was the camera on the iPhone for its time? And at what point do you think Apple really established themselves as great makers of smartphone cameras. Because if you look at Google, for example, before they were not as well known for having the best cameras on the market, but especially in the past three years with software optimization and everything, they've become one of the best and arguably the best on the market. Yeah, so I think you hear the term like potato camera thrown yeah. around for some of the front facing <laughs> cameras on Apple laptops. Uh, this two megapixel camera was, what's worse than a potato camera? Like, let's call it a, like a watermelon. It was a watermelon camera, it was bad. Um, but it was on par for phones at the time. Obviously, we're looking yeah. back hindsight, you know, years and oh, years my back. My first one was 0 0.3, so it's... Yeah. And it took five, it was like a long exposure, but in daylight. It took like five seconds to take a photo. It took a long time. The shutter was, was long. It was not a good camera. Yeah. It was more of like you wanted to capture a memory. You weren't going to reproduce the picture. I think cameras have probably seen the biggest change from smartphones now. What hasn't changed, like you said, is battery. I mean, this is still a lithium ion battery. Same, essentially the same technology yeah. that we have now. The Except back then it was a, that phone has a one core processor with 128 megabytes of RAM, which, and that display resolution is about the same as the Apple Watch today. So there really wasn't too much to power. There weren't kind of differences between apps that take up yeah. more data. There's like location data. There was, there was maps on that phone, right? There was, it was Google Maps, Google I believe. Google Maps, really? Launch, yeah. Was there a YouTube app on that phone? Yeah, actually, well? they were chipped with a YouTube app. Really? They worked with Google on that. And it was, a, I loved the original YouTube app. Yeah. And then they got in a fight and YouTube app when went When I away. first started YouTube, it was the brown YouTube app. And mm -hmm. I used to upload my videos directly from that brown YouTube app in 480p. There used to be like that blue bar that uploaded your videos. Yeah. And um, you'd sit there and you'd like impatiently wait. And if you typed in your title and description on your phone or your iPod, you couldn't change it afterwards unless you like figured out <laughs> how to go on the computer. And for two years, I didn't know how to do that. So if I messed it up, I had to like quickly like cancel it out, but I didn't want to wait for 720p. So I remember 480 was, was the thing. 480, 480 was good. But this phone doesn't even have video, right? No, was there, was, until the 3G? There, there was no video. Um, yeah, so the 3G brought video finally. So up to now, I've had troubles with battery life on iPhones. The iPhone XS, I would get like half a day or something. And I feel like- You got half a day? Yeah. I, I, what are you doing? I went to Apple store and they plugged my phone in and they're like, your battery life is not at 80% yet. So we're not gonna give you a new phone, but you've charged this thing 770 times in Oof. one year. So by noon, I'm at like 20% most of the time. How was the battery life on the iPhone one? Was it easily able to last you through an entire day? And where do you think manufacturers need to improve on 
to on like the power aspect. Yeah. So we see like fast charging, we see faster wireless charging, we're seeing reverse wireless charge, we're seeing batteries comfortably being able to reach like around 4,000 milliamp hours, kind of like on this iPhone. Where do you think it's going to be headed? And do you think the progression in the last 12 years has sure. been enough? So I don't remember having battery issues with the original iPhone. But again, I, I don't recall if I get through a full day, but I imagine I did. I would have through like that would have stuck out in my head. Yeah. Uh, so battery technology hasn't changed, but charging technology has. Yeah. And so you see things like you know, dash charge, and fast charge. It's putting loop charging. And yeah, it's putting so much juice into these lithium cells so fast that the cells themselves are just not going to last as long. But then these Asian companies that are really pushing the charging innovation, they're launching phones every five months. Yeah, so, so the, the, the light cycle, you don't, you don't see it. So like, if you charge an electric car, generally, if you're gonna start pushing out a huge amount of kilowatts, it doesn't start like at zero and it doesn't go all the way up to 100 because you'll yeah. like, blow up the batteries. It speeds and then it slows down it at a certain point. It speeds and slows. Which for phones, I think is around 80%, right? So mm -hmm. most phones do that, but some phones like let you start doing that fast charge early and then almost till the end, which till is- Till about 50. Well, like the sweet spot, I think the big advantage of speed charge is to be able to get as much as you can out of 30 minutes. It seems yeah. like, and then 15 minutes gets you like half a day, but the kind of general consensus for an average consumer is that a good fast, fast charging technology gets you a full day of use in 30 minutes. So if you forget to plug it in mm -hmm. overnight, you can, while you're in the shower, getting breakfast, plug it in and you're good to go. I think we'll see the next big change in phones, I imagine will be when the battery technology changes, whether yeah. it's you know, lithium air or something else crazy um, that comes out, that's where you start to see a big change. It's almost a matter of who's gonna, who's gonna jump first, because right now pretty much every phone still uses lithium ion. It's yeah. cheap to make and they've got tons of it and they all have like, prob they all have the same suppliers, right? For the most part. For the most part. Yeah. So that's, in terms of battery life, I mean, 12 years in, the iPhone is able to last a full day, but I feel like other areas of innovation have moved much faster than that. I mean, processors now are like six cores, some phones have eight cores. You've got up to 12 gigs of RAM in a phone. You've got these crazy resolution displays, which are like OLED, HDR, um, 1200 nits, and just, I wouldn't necessarily say battery innovation has been extremely slow, but everything else has just been so fast with like silicon and everything. So it seems like the optimizations have been made more in like the silicon and the software optimization side as opposed to just like lithium ions as a whole. Yeah. it's like. Engines have gotten better and better, but like gas tank size stayed the same. Yeah. So like they're, they're more power, more hungry, more fuel consuming, but the tanks aren't getting that much bigger. Aside from like, you know, the Asus Republic of Gaming 2, which yeah. is, you know, 6,000 million power battery, that's like an outlier. For the most part, phones are at like 25 to 35 or yeah. 4,000. So I think the last thing we're gonna talk about here, and a good question to ask John, who has pretty much seen every single piece of tech that is come. Old, you're calling me old again. <laughs> In the past, like, decade and a half, um, is what do you expect to see in smartphones moving forward and what are you most excited for? What kind of smartphone feature do you feel like is a little bit too far ahead of its time and which areas do you think need improvement and just as from like an analyst perspective, yeah. where do you see it going? So the boring answer is security is going to get better. And you think about what information people have about themselves, their family, yeah. on their phones. Security is going to be a huge jump. Whether it's how it authenticates your, whether it's your face, your fingerprint, whether it's using the blood vessels in your hand, like we're seeing with LG, uh, that's going to be a big, a big sea change moving forward. Yeah. Um, form factors, I think we're starting to see that now with something like the Galaxy Fold, which obviously is like, essentially is a developer's device. Yeah. But foldable, I think is going to be very interesting. I think we'll start seeing phones be more convergent. So whether your phone could be docked and become a laptop, the power is there. Samsung DeX being a really, really good example of exactly. it. Exactly, I mean, thinking about the old like Motorola Atrix, like that was sort of, you could dock your phone inside of a laptop screen. That was very ahead of its time. Um, I think we're gonna see the form factors change. Yeah. And I think how people view their phones and what their phones should do and could do are going to change. Um, phones that can become tablets, I think will be huge. And tablets that can become phones once the limitations of foldable sort of get eliminated. Um, it's gonna be a fun time, I think, the next five to seven years for weird and crazy form factors that we haven't seen in forever. Obviously, obviously foldables are coming. They're not useful yet. They're cool, and it's like, wow, look what my phone can do. I mean, it's kind of like the Edge, the Samsung Galaxy Edge. Exactly. Some people use it, but it's still kind of one of those things where it was more to show off where display technology has come, as opposed to knowing what to really do with it and getting consumers used to the form factor and also being willing to pay the price. I mean, with the iPhone 1, for example, it is a flat phone. It's like a pretty regular phone, but it obviously was ahead of its time as mm -hmm. well. But I think 
with foldable displays, this is like a whole new thing where it's it's almost kind of weird. I mean, I had the LG V50 thing for a little bit, and I found it kind of weird how I had the two screen and I didn't really know what to do with it. Um, yeah, because we've, we've never seen anything like that. Yeah. And there are going to be inherent limitations. You can't really fold glass. Uh, so whether or not they figure out to make a seam or, or not have a yeah. seam is... And durability is always a big question. It's going to be a huge issue, but when you can have one f device that can do multiple things, a phone that's a tablet or a phone that can become uh, a laptop or a computer, that's going to be cool. Yeah. And so phone design, I think, is going to go undergo a crazy revolution over the next five to seven years. I think the biggest thing that I'm excited for is just for phones to have the fast refresh rate on the screen. And obviously, cameras are just going to keep getting better and better. But on the Android side, video still needs a little bit of improvement. But I think it was cool to take a look at the iPhone 1 and the iPhone 11 Pro and just take a look at them side by side. Just holding on this, I don't really know what to say about it. It's cool. It's got the aluminum, the two-tone design, and... Who knows? Maybe they should do like a limited edition, like dude, I would love form factor with a home I, button. Dude, I, if they brought that design <laughs> in this size, when Touch ID comes back as inevitably an in-screen fingerprint reader, if they made it look like one of the yeah. older generation iPhones and shipped it with the same wallpaper, and I think it'd be a pretty cool, yeah. a pretty cool uh, touch, or at least maybe make it like the iPhone five. But I think design. we're dreaming a little bit here. Maybe hopes and dreams here. <laughs> Always there, and Apple's slowly giving it to us one by one based on what things we hope to see on future devices. But otherwise, thank you guys so much for watching this video. Thank you for, thank you for having me. making this video with me about the iPhone 1 because I knew nothing about it before today. And I'll see you guys in my next one.